Hello and welcome to the Kamla Sohni Memorial Lecture Series by the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. In this series, extraordinary women scientists from India will take you through their work and the stories of their lives. Without further ado, here is today's speaker. I would very much like to express my gratitude to Dr. Gagandeep Khan, who has very kindly consented to be the first speaker in this uh, series. Uh, Professor uh, Gagandeep uh, Khan is a clinician scientist. She is a, a professor in the Department of uh, Gastrointestinal Sciences at the Christian Medical College at Velo, where she also uh, studied, and is currently uh, executive director of the Transnational Health Science and Technology Institute, which I believe is linked to the uh, Department of Biotechnology, um, <clears throat> where she is a leading research uh, scientist with a very major focus on viral infections in children and in the testing of uh, rotaviral vaccines. Um, she was awarded the prestigious Infosys Prize in Life Sciences in 2016 for her contributions in this field. And uh, she has published uh, nearly 300 scientific uh, papers. Um, as was pointed out by Dr. Vijay Raghavan, she is the first woman scientist to be elected fellow of the Royal Society in its more than 350 years of history. Uh, so, um, she is really, in that sense, uh, a real role model uh, for the uh, younger generation. So, I now have very great pleasure in giving the floor to Dr. Gagandeep Kaur. So, good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. Um, you know, recently people have been saying a lot of things about me, and I always feel like I'm a bit of a fraud. And that's because I come from a place of privilege. I am from a section of society, as are all of you, where we have had ample opportunities to do the things that we have wanted to do. Women in our class of society are not restricted in terms of education. We get support in many shapes and forms. And when I look around me, I see women achievers everywhere. As was pointed out just now, if you look at fields of science and you look for women to speak about science in India, you will find them. So when I thought about you know, my journey in science, I thought I was doing what everybody else was doing until I started to look at the numbers. And this was an exercise that was sort of forced on me by the National Institutes of Health that asked me to measure in my institution how many women were there at every level of academia. And when I looked in the Christian Medical College below, uh, an institution started by a woman where there has been at least 40% women in every incoming class, I found that at assistant professor level, yes, it was 50-50. And then as you went up the scales, the proportion of women was decreasing. And then I started to see if this can happen in a place like CMC, what is the rest of the country like? And when I came to the Translational Health Science and Technology Institute, it was very interesting. There was one other woman on the faculty. So this, you know, we are the exceptions when we come up here. And what I'm hoping to do in the next few minutes is first to tell you about my work and then to tell you about how I got where I am today. If you look at this picture here, you can see that the child has a raised section of abdomen. This is called a pinch test. You do a pinch test when a child has diarrhea. When you take a fold of skin and pinch it, if it doesn't go back in two seconds, that means that the child is dehydrated and requires rehydration. 
Now, if you look at the size of people, you know, we are a certain weight. Let's say the average person is about 60 kilos. The average baby at about six months of age, seven months of age is about six kilos. But in terms of surface area, the baby has about a quarter of the surface area at a tenth the weight. That means when dehydration happens, it happens much faster in children. And why is that important? Because dehydration can kill. So what I work on is this really rather pretty virus that is shown up here. This is obviously a reconstruction. It's a very simple virus. It has 12 proteins. And one of those proteins, which is a non-structural protein, actually affects the cells in the gut. What it leads to through a mechanism of calcium signaling is a lot of chloride secretion into the gut. When chloride, an iron, is secreted into the gut, water follows. And if the colon can't absorb the amount of water that is coming into the gut, we get diarrhea. And loss of fluid from diarrhea can lead to dehydration. Rotavirus actually has another trick up its sleeve. It causes vomiting. So if all of you know that when you have diarrhea, what you want to do is give fluids, it becomes a little difficult to give fluids orally when you have both vomiting and diarrhea. So that's why if you can't get children to care quickly enough, they can die. Now what I've been doing, and this pyramid here, is about 10 years of work for me. Essentially what we have done is study diarrhea in the community, study diarrhea in the hospital, and make estimates for how much death is caused by diarrhea. So if you take the 27 million children that are born in India every year, one in two children will have a diarrhea, one in eight children will require an OPD visit for that diarrhea, one in 30 children will be hospitalized, and one in 350 children will die. How do we know this? Because we did the community studies, we did studies all around India in hospitals, and for the deaths, we had some deaths in our community and hospital populations, but we also looked at government estimates of how many children were dying of diarrhea in different places. We also looked at what this meant for households. If you have a child admitted with diarrhea and you work in the kinds of places where we were doing the surveillance, a rotavirus hospitalization cost 5% of the mean de median annual household income. So not only do you have a child who is sick enough to be in a hospital, you're also taking a significant economic hit because of this virus. So we did studies in the community trying to understand how we could protect against this virus. And the first studies we did really were rather disappointing. There were studies that had been done in other parts of the world that showed that essentially if your child had two rotavirus infections, natural infections, they would be protected from diarrhea. But if you looked at children in our slums, two infections gave you 57% protection and three gave you 80% protection. We plugged that information into a model and said, if we have a vaccine, we think the vaccine is going to give us about 45 to 50 percent protection, and we don't think that that protection is going to last. In rich countries, we think that they get much better protection, and that protection lasts for a long time. That will not be the case when vaccines are brought to India. Nonetheless, given the fact that we have so many diarrheal infections, we also estimated 
that if we had a vaccine that was even 50% effective as we were predicting, this would save 30,000 lives every year. We worked with a very large consortium and that resulted in a rotavirus vaccine that was supported by the Department of Biotechnology for over 20 years and finally was made by an Indian company, Bharat Biotech, and was introduced into the National Immunization Program in 2016. Now, in order to see whether the vaccine was really working very well or not, we did a study where we had 34 hospitals looking at children who were admitted with diarrhea, then looking backwards to see whether they had vaccine or not, and then seeing whether the vaccine was working or not. Now, when you do a trial, when you're testing vaccines, you actually usually take really healthy babies, and then you follow them up to see if they are protected. In the trials that we did towards licensure, those babies had protection, about 55% protection. So that was what our model had predicted, and we found it in the vaccine trial. But we wanted to see whether in, real, in the real world was that the case. And the, these data are just emerging. They are unpublished, but what it shows us is that the vaccine protection is really as much as we saw in the efficacy studies in the first year of life. But this is the real world and all children are not healthy. And if you look at chronically malnourished children, they are usually stunted. Stunted is they are short for their age. And that's a sign of chronic malnutrition. And if you look here, you see that in the first year of life, stunted children are reasonably well protected, but they have no protection in the second year of life. Normally nourished children maintain the protection. So what we had predicted in our model, which was built on stunted children, is holding up. Now, why is this important for us? When you look at children who live in really poor areas, these children take multiple hits. This particular girl was born low birth weight. She was weaned early, so she had very little breastfeeding. Her mother is not particularly educated. She is the first child. This is her growth chart. Where we would like to see her is up here where she actually is, as you can see here, is pretty low down. This should be her height on the green line. This red line indicates a height for age score of minus two. She's actually well below that score. So this is a chronically malnourished child. She looks healthy, doesn't she? So Stunting is a hidden burden of malnutrition that we don't see. What else do stunted children have? One of the things that I've tried to understand is the gut environment. And to do that, I said, these are children in slums. Why don't we look at rich kids as well? Now, if you know the Christian Medical College well, you know that we are not rich. But we are better off than people who live in slums. And what we did was measure two things. One was measure how, mu how many potentially dangerous bugs there were in these children's guts. And we found that if you look in the slum area, each child that looks healthy had four bugs. Looks healthy, no diarrhea, four bugs. Doctor's children in Velo, one bug. So four times greater pathogens being carried in their guts. If you look at inflammatory markers, again, we measured them in doctor's children and in children in the slums. And you can see what the doctor's children were like, pretty close to zero. Children in the slums had really high counts. This was about 1,600. 
Do you know what the diagnosis for inflammatory bowel disease is? Above 200. So our children have eight times greater inflammation in their guts than somebody who has a diagnosis as an adult of inflammatory bowel disease. So their guts are getting damaged. What does that mean? That means you have chronic malnutrition. And in our setting, we find that children have about 30% stunting. We thought, what does this stunting do? We can see what happens to their physical development, but what's happening to their mental development? So we've been tracking these children now for nearly 20 years. And what we find is that the median IQ in slums is 89. That is low normal. 90 to 110 is normal. So if our median IQ is like this, that means that there is a distribution around it. And when we look at children who have been persistently stunted, stunted for long periods of time, their IQs are significantly lower than children who have never been stunted. So what this means in terms of our society, in terms of what it will do to our economy, has been measured by people overseas. It's been estimated that for every five points that you lose in IQ, you actually lose about 10% in your terminal income. This is a problem for India. Between three and four out of 10 children in India are chronically stunted in more than 200 districts. There is no district with less than 10% stunting. And this has a distribution where it's worse in the north and the center of the country than in the south. And our data are from the south. We have no measurements of this kind from the north. Thank you very much, uh, Gandhi, for what was uh, really a very, very inspiring address. Uh, thank you for your time. You are listening to the Kamla Sohni Memorial Lecture Series by the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. You can catch more lectures on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts.